va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ozil. Marca Mesut Ozil. Is Arsecast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James, goodly afternoon. Goodly afternoon indeed. Or, How are you today? I'm fine. Oh. Should I say goodly afternoon to you, James? <laughs> uh, yes, that is what you should say. We should probably address what that's a reference to, shouldn't yeah, we? Some um, people won't get it, I guess. I guess. So I appeared uh, briefly on the Athletics Daily Transfer Roundup podcast. And the way in which I do that is they just say, look, can you give us a, an Arsenal transfer update? Send us a voice note and we'll bang it on the show. And to be honest with you, I haven't got time to listen to the show most of the time. So I never even know if they use it or whatever. But yesterday I got so many messages from people saying, what have they done to your voice? Um <laughs> And as you've just suggested, they had sort of, had they slowed it down? They definitely deepened it in some way. Yeah, the pitch was certainly lower than it was. It sounded a little bit slower, too, than your normal mm. speaking cadence. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was slower. And to be honest, because they usually ask me to do like a 60-second update, I said quite a lot quite fast. And I think maybe they thought, this is just unlistenably fast and high we must deal with it my sort of pet theory is they're just trying to make me sound more like david ornstein who has quite sort of sonorous tones you know mm. yeah you do you do sound very different the two of it, you and you know look i know technology is a wonderful thing we've got we've got uh you know pitch shifting and we've got what's that thing auto tune that the singers use you know we've well, got all those voice, things yeah, which well, was very popular <gasps> on the Arscast extra we do have robot voice don't we should i go on Oh, is it not? Come on. Oh, no. <gasps> no. <laughs> the batteries have run out on my robot voice machine. Oh, no. Oh, this is no. A, it's not a goodly afternoon anymore. Oh, I'm going home. I am at home. <laughs> What's happening here? This is bullshit. Well, that's the end of the <gasps> podcast, no, guys. It's on. it's on. It's on. Oh, hang on. It's on. Will it do it? Hello. Hello. Ooh. A tentative <laughs> robot. Hello, the world's James. most tentative robot. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to figure that out a bit later on. But anyway. Incredibly exciting. Can I just ask, is that like a special machine? Like what, how are you doing that? It's an actual machine. So it's not like a software-based thing. It's an actual little box here in front of me that does all kinds of uh, effects, to be honest. Uh, wow. But robot, robot is one of them. I tell you what I'll do. Towards the end of the show, I'll go. I'll, I'll go through the whole range of the machine's wonderful voices because okay, fine. We, we should get on with talking about Arsenal because that is why people are here and the reason why it's a goodly afternoon is because Arsenal won and mm. we're through to the fifth round of the FA Cup, having beaten Bournemouth two one at the Vitality Stadium last night. You were there. What was uh, what was your um, take on it? Just tell me everything about what happened, and I, I'll play with the robot voice machine. No, um, you know it was it was a good win, and uh, Mikel Arteta's faith in some of the uh, some of the young players was really rewarded. I think that's the big yeah. takeaway. I, I was a little bit surprised by the starting eleven. I thought he might go kind of full strength, given that there was a bit of space between the fixtures and given that we know he takes every game very seriously at the moment, I thought maybe, you know, Mesut Ozil, Alex Lacazette, people like that would play. It was actually, you know, a little bit weaker than I anticipated. You know, weaker seems harsh given how they played, but younger, more inexperienced players playing and Ketia, Willock, Ganduzi came in, Martinelli and Saka stayed in. Mm. And Bournemouth had a stronger side than I thought because given their Premier League troubles, I thought they would absolutely sack this game off. But with the exception of a little bit of rotation here and there, it was a pretty strong 11 from then. And I thought it was a real credit to those young players, the way they played, particularly in the first half. I mean, that 45 minutes that they put together, yeah. uh, I, I think is, you know, uh, one of the best, certainly the best, I think they've played away from home under Mikel Arteta. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I thought they were excellent. Yeah, I mean, that was uh, our first away win since December the 9th when we beat West Ham. Mm. Uh, and only our third away win of the season. Uh, 
So, you know, Bournemouth weren't good. I think it's fair to say they weren't good in the first half. Uh, In Mm -hmm. particular, they were better in the second half. But, you know, we've got to give the boys some credit for what they did. And I think, you know, the focus really should be on how well we did in that first period rather than, than how poor the opposition were. And I think an interesting part of that is, you know, when you look at the way teams used to set up against us, particularly away from home, you know, they kind of go for us a little bit or they press us quite high, wouldn't they? You know, because they knew we weren't necessarily as solid or we weren't as assured uh, as you would expect us to be. And I think there's something interesting that's happened in the last couple of games where the opposition have been very standoffish, where they've sort of said, OK, th- we can see that they can play now. They can move the ball, they can pass, they can find space, they can work the channels, they can get men in behind, you know, they can keep the ball. They're not flustered too badly if you if you put a bit of pressure on them. And I think it's a testament to the way that the team has improved on the ball that Bournemouth's approach was, was like that. Um, team selection we've sort of talked about, but, I, you know, in Ketia, I just want to start with because... It felt to me like if we were keeping him, we were only keeping him because we were going to give him some minutes. Of course. I don't think Burnley away is the game which you start, Eddie and Kedia. You know, with all due respect to to him, uh, Lacazette is, you know, there. And Aubameyang, of course, will be back from suspension. So it always felt like the FA Cup was going to be a game in which he was going to be given a chance. Um, And I did think as well, perhaps Joe Willock might come in. I thought it might be Danny Ceballos, and we might talk about him a little bit later on. but, But Arteta was absolutely right and justified in the selection that he made. And I think when you look at... Willock in particular, who had a very bright start to the season off the back of a very good preseason, you know, on the tour in America, kind of lost his way a little bit. Um, mm. But, but uh, you know, last night against Bournemouth, I thought he was, he was really excellent. I thought he played very, very well, very maturely, and of course was involved in both the goals. Yeah, I actually tweeted during the game something about how I thought Joe Willett was was doing very well and someone replied being like, yeah, he just needs to show some fucking consistency. And I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, that's what young players do. You know, they are often inconsistent. They can't all be Gabriel Martinelli. They will have... Highs and lows. Even and, he's and he, not massively consistent. You know, I think there are there. Are, you know, his goal scoring is consistent, yeah, but sure, his performance level sure. probably isn't. Exactly. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think that comes with the territory, and we've seen that with other players. We've seen it with Gunduzi this se- season. People who come in and out of form, and I, I thought it was a really good night for Joe Willett. What was great about this eleven that we put out was I thought that Enketia, Martinelli, Willett, those were all guys at the top end of the pitch who really you know worked every yard mm. of that of that half and sort of closed Bournemouth down didn't give them a moment's peace on the ball were creating turnovers they were physical and it just meant that we sort of were dangerous in every aspect you know we had good passing out the back we had good pressing at the front and we really controlled that first half and yeah I thought Willett was was really really good and it was sort of interesting wasn't it because you know, that role, I think, is a difficult one and one that we've struggled with all season long, really. Who's going to link the midfield and the yeah. attack? And there are different ways you can attack that problem and different styles of players that can suit that role. I have to say, I really like a, a lot of the aspects that Joe Willock brings to it. And it's not to say necessarily that Joe Willock, you know, should play every game for Arsenal. But I do think, you know, come the summer, if we are looking for a, an attacking midfield player, I think some of those traits that he has um, would be beneficial to this team. Yeah, I think sometimes people look at him through the prism of, of who he's playing instead of, right? Um, mm. And last night you might say that's Mesut Ozil, who's a classic number 10. And people say, well, Willock is not a number 10. Of course he's not. We can see that he's not. Uh, and he's much more, uh, you know, if you want to be, yeah, I guess, uh, sort of a number eight, isn't he? Uh, uh, there's a, an element of Aaron Ramsey to, to the mm. way he plays. And I think we've said that before in terms of how he likes to get forward, how he likes to get in the box, the way he arrives in the box. And just, you know, he's not that kind of mercurial playmaker in the way that Ozil is, but he does make things happen in his own way. And he was, you know, key to, um, not key, but he was very, very much involved in, in both goals. The first one was a really smart turn, wasn't it? He just kind of gave yeah. the guy a little bit of a wiggle of the hips and turned the other way. Uh, he drove towards the box, fed Martinelli, Martinelli to sack. Um, Saka's finish was sensational. I mean, he had another superb game. We'll we'll talk about him now in in a moment as well. But I just think the way that Willock drives 
towards the opposition box, the way that he can do things when he gets in there. There was another moment, wasn't there, uh, where he sort of turned away and had a shot blocked at the near post in the second half. I think he picked the ball up just outside our half and ran all the way up up the field with it and got us a corner. You know, mm-hmm. somebody who can travel with the ball, but also in key areas do something with it. You know, I, I, I said after the US tour and I said after the early part of the season that I was very, very enthused about Joe Willock and what he could bring to this team. He went off the boil a bit, but I think last night was a reminder that, you know, there's a there's a really good young player in there. Again, with the caveat, we're not saying he's going to be, you know, the, the next this, that or the other, but the raw materials are there. And I think Arteta said that pretty much uh, himself after the game. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, people had sort of determined to define him to a position. Is he an eight? Is he a 10? He actually ended up at right wing last mm. night. He's played on the left under Arteta as a substitute. I think actually he's kind of somewhere in between all of those things and that's often where he's at his best, you know, he's breaking in between the lines, just finding that bit of space, applying pressure on on their centre-backs, on their defensive midfield and that ability to carry the ball is what separates him from the rest of his sort of Arsenal teammates really. I mean, I don't think we've got another central midfield player or or number 10 type who can do that Mm. in the same fashion and you know, he's got real power, I think, to, to match a, a bit of skill too. I mean, some of those turns last night, yes, it was about the wiggle of the hips, but it was also about the strength in the shoulders and, you know, the, the turning and the centre of gravity. And I, I really like watching him do that. I've said before that what the way he moves with the ball and glides past people, it can remind me of Diaby, and I, I do see that at times. And, I, yeah, I really actually like him. I think he's a player that I would want in my squad and I think he's often more useful away from home than at home you know against yeah. the mass racks, ranks of a defence I don't think he's the guy who's going to find the you know the eye of the needle pass to break that down but when the game is in transition he really really thrives yeah. and yeah, it was a great, great role in the build-up to the first goal. Martinelli and Saka, their understanding was evident to me from the first minute. I mean, they've got such a great on-field relationship and no surprise that one created the goal for the other. And what a brilliant, brilliant strike that is. Oh. I mean, it was one of those moments that sort of took your breath away. Yeah, really was. I mean, to smash it in at the near post from that angle speaks to, A, an ability, but also a confidence that, you know, he at 18 years of age can come into this team and, and have a go rather than just smack the ball across the box. He, he's willing to take a chance and willing to take an opportunity. And, you know, he, he has been r- just such a such a fantastic um, revelation is not the right word because we knew there was a potentially a very good player there. But the the ease, even that's the wrong way to say, it because I'm sure it's not easy, but how comfortable he looks at just 18 years of age coming into a team. He's played some games at left wing. He's played some games a little bit further forward but you know over the last little while he's been asked to do a job at left back I know it's not completely unfamiliar to him he's played some youth football there and and what have you but you know this is a different level this is Premier League level you're playing against Premier League teams you're not being exposed defensively you're making a contribution from an attacking point of view and to do it at 18 years of age and and to you know to to provide end product, I think that's the, the the most interesting thing about these young players that we're so excited about and we're so enthused about. We're looking at, you know, Mesut Ozil. I'm not saying this to be absolutely critical of Mesut Ozil, but, you know, he hasn't got a goal since I don't know when last season. I think he's got one assist this season and that's from a corner. So the end product is not there. You know, Alexandre Lacazette has not scored a goal since December. Of course, he's working hard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but, you know, hard work doesn't win you games. Goals win you games. Assists win you games. And when you look at what Martinelli has done, scored 10 times. Joe Willock has scored four times this season. Saka has six assists, I think, and, and three goals. Yeah. You know, these are young men who are actually taking a chance, showing that they can play, but also producing. They're giving us something tangible in games beyond us looking at them and saying, well, he looks like a good player. If he could just add a bit of this or if he could just add that, you know, maybe he could make it to the next level. They're already doing it, you know, and we we look at what uh, they did last night 
Three 20-year-olds, Inkedia, Willock and Gunduzi, who we're going to talk about a bit later on as well because I think he'd a, he'd a very good game. Two 18-year-olds in Saka and Martinelli. You know, when we needed someone to step up in the absence of Aubameyang, it's been these guys to a, mm. to a large extent that have that have done that. And the goals have been slightly more spread around the team since Mikel Arteta came in, which mm. I think is is a, a big benefit. But yeah, that, I mean that Saka assist stat, I think it makes him the you know the leading player at Arsenal in terms of assists, which I kind of found remarkable. I think there wow. have been th- three matches this season in which he's both scored and provided an assist. Uh, this was a, the, the latest of those. So yeah, he, he's been. Absolutely fantastic. I think it is right to say he's been a revelation in this position because as much as we were all high on him and had great hopes for him, I don't think too many people were saying it's going to be as left back, you know, or, or, or anticipating him having that kind of impact in that position. It felt like a an emergency mm. decision to put him there, but he's flourished. And yeah, it was... It was just great. I mean, you know, some of those kids are academy kids. Others are ones we've brought in, like Ganduzi and Martinelli. uh, And they've been really, really great recruitment. And while I think it is possible and reasonable to question, you know, the wisdom of some of our expenditure, I think when we've looked at younger players in the last few years, we've we've generally done better there, I would say. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of just... uh, uh, looking at the stats and looking at assists mm. uh, this is via transfer marked um, they have Saka as our leading assist maker with mm. six after that you've got Pepe and Martinelli and Callum Chambers remarkably with four yeah he's got four yeah Genduzi with three Lacazette two Maitland Niles two Kalasinac two Nelson two Ceballos and Ozil uh, Ozil has two here I don't know where the second one came from I could be wrong Tierney with a couple etc etc so you know there's the impact of, of what Saka is doing and you know he got a, an assist for the second goal as well um and you know he's not taking corners or free kicks, which yeah, some of those players true. in that in that ranking are, and that's mm. sort of pumping up their stats. I, I mean, that speaks partly to the evolving role of fullbacks, but also just to how yeah. how excellent Saka's been. And it was a brilliant, brilliant cross from him at the end of a fantastic Arsenal move for the yeah, second goal. It was lovely, wasn't it? I mean, I think you you can go back. There was a smart pass from Mustafi into Enkedia. His layoff to Willock was good. Willock's first time pass was it a first time pass? I'm yeah, almost certain it was a first time pass but with his left foot and what I really like let me have a look at it here again I'm just watching it again no he took a touch and then he he played a pass with his left foot but what I loved about the pass was that it was just perfectly weighted in front of Saka I think one of the things that really frustrates me about professional footballers is where you see a guy running down the wing and he has to stop and check his run for a pass that's played you know with not enough pace or it's played Mm. behind him it just fucking does my head in because you know there's so much momentum lost when you have to go back and you lose even half a second a second Um, so I really like that about the uh, the pass from Willock, the cross into the middle, and Keddy is there. I think if you're looking at uh, you know anybody in this Arsenal team uh, or, or that Arsenal team last night anyway, who was going to score that goal, it's in Keddy. I mean, that's what he is. He's a penalty box poacher. Yeah, and actually, if you watch the run that he makes, I mean, he's involved in the move about 30 yards from goal, not long before he turns up on the penalty spot to put it away, but... As you say, that's classic Nketiah, that movement inside the penalty area. Every single Arsenal outfield player touched the ball uh, in the move that Mm. led to that goal across the 22 passes. I think it's worth mentioning Mustafi's passing because it was really good in the first half. Uh, He was playing sort of diagonals and, you know, the crowd was singing his name. It was his best Arsenal performance for quite a long time, which uh, makes the way it ended an extra shame, I guess. Uh, But yeah, a a really good move and and Willock again, instrumental, Saka's cross and and Ketia tucks it away, which is what he does. And that will have been a a big moment for him because, you know, it's a risk in some ways for him to stay at Arsenal. He could have gone out to Bristol City or wherever and known he'd get football and, and get goals. You know, by staying on, he's taken on a challenge and every positive moment, every goal is going to help him Mm. in that. And maybe it'll just mean 
if we are chasing the game in the next few weeks, Mikel Arteta will look at Eddie and Ketia sat on that bench and think, do you know what? I will give him a go and that could be a, a big difference for him. Yeah, exactly. Just even to have another striker to bring off the bench if we need a goal. Yeah. Um, can I just say a big fuck you to Mike Dean and VAR for doing everything they could possibly do to see if they could disallow that goal in some way. I mean, it's, I it's just ridiculous. It really yeah. was ridiculous. And I, I think the same for the, uh, for the Bournemouth goal that they scored late on. You yeah. know, there was one replay that I watched and went, okay, that's a perfectly good goal. Why do we need to spend two minutes drawing lines higgledy-piggledy all over the screen? I just fucking, it's, it's really annoying. Really yeah. annoying. The Arsenal one was particularly egregious, I thought. Well, I mean, I know Martinelli went for the ball, but he didn't mm. actually touch it. And obviously that makes him active. But it was pretty clear. I mean, for me, I just find it exhausting when, you know, they draw the line and you're like, well, I guess they're absolutely level. And then they sort of try and... I mean, it was just yeah. so painful. It so really painful. was. The, the, the different kind of lines they had coming down from Martinelli's knee Ooh, and stuff like that. It's like, well, what are you trying to do here? I mean, it's just... It's absolute shite. Um, yeah. So 2-0 up, playing very well. Um, and can I just say, it yeah. was a really encouraging thing that Arsenal went and got that second goal because we went ahead early on and we were dominant. And a big problem for this team in recent weeks, in my eyes, has been their their inability to capitalise on that dominance. And that second goal, you know, did that and gave them a, a sure foothold. Yeah, I mean, do you think Arteta might be a little bit unhappy that they didn't push that advantage a bit Maybe. more? Yeah. You know, I think he... I think he might be. Look, I, you know, it's it's a lot to ask to go away from home and, and score three goals in a half. But when you're playing that well and when Bournemouth were really struggling to get on top of us, you know, we talk about a one-goal lead being precarious. But, you know, a two-goal lead can be precarious as the last five minutes uh, of the game showed. As soon as they score one, you're like, uh-oh, you know, one more could really uh, could really damage us here. And the last thing I think we needed was, uh, was a replay. But it's maybe nitpicking, you know. Again. Well, I know what you mean. It's interesting, isn't it? Because because as, as good as Arsenal were, this continues the sort of Mikel Arteta pattern of being a relatively low shot game. I mean, we finished with seven shots apiece. Now, granted, that's partly because we slowed up dramatically in the second half. But, you know, we didn't, I suppose, convert our dominance into, you know, a, a huge array of goal scoring opportunities. It's not like we were missing any any sitters in that first half. So there is still work to be done, I think. But it was, for the most part, very composed, very assured, and Bournemouth were bad and were just nowhere in the contest at that mm. point. So they were better in the second half, you would say? They Bournemouth, were. they were more yeah. at it. They they made it a bit more difficult for us. Clearly, they got they got some talking to at halftime um, and made it a bit more difficult for us in the second half. I mean, I think it has been a little bit of a feature of Arteta's games in that you know, there's one good half and one mm -hmm. maybe not quite as, um, what's the word, controlled um, period yeah. of, of football. But I think that's that's kind of normal. I think also when you're winning 2-0, uh, you're not under any obligation really to go and drive forward and take risks from an attacking point of view. And you, you're, you're set up in a way which... Um, I suppose, lends itself to a counter-attacking approach. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, goals change the pattern of games. And once Arsenal were two ahead, it's very possible their foot did come off the gas. But from a Bournemouth perspective, you know, Eddie Howe spoke afterwards about how he just didn't consider it a tactical issue. He was really unhappy with their attitude in the first half. And I think they did get a big bollocking at half-time and, and were a little bit more at it. But that said, I mm. mean... We weren't especially uncomfortable until, well, probably until Bournemouth got their goal, really, which was, when was that? Like, almost the the final, well, it was the 94th minute. Yeah, of the 10 minutes of injury time that we played. Um, it was like a war zone out there, to be honest. The amount of injuries and stoppages was, was It crazy. was, wasn't it? There was there were a number of, of difficult moments. There were a couple where I thought, uh-oh, you know, because Saka went down, he got a whack and... Bellerin got a whack and I think there was a Bournemouth player got a whack he ran into into Ganduzi. Um yeah it was it was a bit difficult I suppose that the main feature of that um, second half is the injury to to Mustafi yeah um, like he'd played pretty well I thought 
I thought mm-hmm. he'd had a good game. He passed the ball well. Um, what did you make of the decision to start him? Did you were you surprised that Rob Holding didn't get a run out given the rotation in some other areas? I kind of thought that it was going to be a case of either Bellerin or Holding. Right. That's where I think um, some of the decision making came into it. I think it might have just been too risky for Arteta to play two guys who are just, you know, not long back from a a cruciate injury. So that's why I think maybe Holding sat on the bench. Maybe it tells us a little bit of something about, you know, Holding's readiness or or how Arteta perceives him to be ready or how ready he perceives him to be. I I wonder as well, maybe if there was an element of Arteta trying to um, give our, our Mustafi a a bit of redemption, a chance at redemption, because he spoke Mm -hmm. quite highly of him uh, over the weekend and talked about how, you know, it was his job to to make him a better player and anyone can make a mistake and he liked the reaction to the mistake, you know, which is fine. And I think in some ways, you know, Arteta's got to be like that with Mustafi and everybody else. He's promised everyone a clean slate. Um, So I think he's got to be kind of true to that in a way. Um, I, I, I... yeah, look, I think his selection on the night was justified in terms of, of how he played. Like, I, you know, he's never going to be my favourite player. I don't really think he's got a long-term future at the club. But if and when he plays, he plays well and doesn't make a mistake, then I'm happy with that. It's a mm. risky thing for a manager, though, isn't it, when a player is that error-prone? Because every time something happens you're going to be the one who gets the pelters for it because you must know that this this is this guy is capable of it. Yeah. Uh, it is a, it's a bit of a gamble on Mikel's part, but I think he must consider Rob holding a bit of a gamble. I think presumably for foot, fitness reasons more than anything else. I mean, mm. it's been a very slow and steady comeback for for Rob holding. Well, maybe steady is not the right word to be honest because there've been a couple of setbacks already. Uh so, you know, I don't think He's quite in a position to be parachuted into the team anytime soon. Yeah. But, you know, Mustafi was having a good game. The fans were more positive about Mustafi than I've, well, seen in years at an Arsenal match. His name was sung several times during the match and again when he went off. And that looked a bad injury to me. I mean, yeah. you know, we were wondering if he would still be here come the end of the window. I would say he's not passing a medical with that one. No, he, even so, I don't think he was going to be let go anyway in January, mm. to be honest. Um, I mean, it does. It depends on how serious it is. I saw him send out a tweet earlier on saying, thanks for the support, I'll be back soon. But maybe they haven't had a diagnosis or maybe he's been told it's not quite as bad as it looks. It looked really bad. You know, the way that his foot went underneath him as he as he landed. Um, and it, clearly, it looked, yeah. Uh, Arteta said the ankle after the game, but it looked almost like Achilles, really, to me, the way he landed on it. Yes, a few people have said that, all right. Um, it depends, you know, what has got stretched or tweaked or, yeah. or whatever it might be. So we'll wait for a diagnosis and, and, and see. But if there is a long-term injury or a prolonged injury from Mustafi, um, you know, we're, we're, we don't have a lot of depth at centre half, yeah. uh, and I think you know Arteta said afterwards, didn't he? It, it it's not going to impact our transfer plans because I think their plan anyway is to bring in a centre half of some description. Um, that's it. I think it doesn't change yeah. anything because they've always wanted to do it. I don't think that's to say uh, they're not going to try and mm. do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's another point I suppose about the second half. The amount of Injuries and stoppages it kind of impeded a little bit the flow too. So yeah. maybe that's why it wasn't quite as easy on the eye as the first. No, time. it was a bit of a battle, and I think uh, you know I've got to give. Uh, we're going to. I've got a question about him, but I do think that uh, Matteo Genduzzi had a really fine second yeah. half. Um, I, I know he he enjoys the kind of um, what's the word. Um, what's a good word uh, for what I'm trying to say here? I mean, shit I think, housing, kinda, yeah, yeah, that's a good word. All right, we'll use that one. Um, I, I think he enjoys that, and I think he enjoys kind of being the pantomime villain a little bit. He does play the role very yeah, well. He does. I mean, I think he was annoying the referee from really early on. I'm surprised he didn't get a booking at some point, given it was mm-hmm. Martin Atkinson. But I thought, you know, defensively, the there were improvements in his game. I thought 
on the ball when we needed to uh, needed somebody in the centre of midfield to just be uh, a little bit tidy and to keep possession and to move the ball to wide areas to sort of uh, give us a, a little bit of relief. I thought he was very good in that regard as well. There's some very good footwork, um, some nice moments on the ball. And he looks just maybe, uh, I know you said this on your, your post-match video as well, like a player who's being coached. And, I, you know, I absolutely agree with that. I think, you know, the, the raw ingredients are there with, with Ganduzi, but it's about putting a structure on top of all that. And I think Arteta's a good guy to do it. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this a lot and sort of why he was so important and uh, almost exciting, I guess, under Emery. And I think it's because basically the structure was really bad and problematic. So having this sort of structuralist midfielder who would kind of do it all saved our bacon a couple of times and sort of enabled us to sort of escape the tactical shackles the team was playing under. Mm. But there's been an adaptation for him because Arteta is implementing a, a proper structure and he's sort of been asked to do a slightly different role. And I thought, actually, I thought when he came on at Chelsea, there were some really positive signs then, but this was another step forward for him. And one of the things I thought was great was the nimble footwork that he showed a few times to sort of evade a couple of markers and, and drive into space. And we haven't seen loads of that from him. And, you know, there were little flourishes to his game that were coming out. Uh, maybe it's just because he was enjoying, I think, winding the Bournemouth fans up and, you know, pulling out <laughs> a bit of skill was only irritating them even more. And there were uh, there was one point where I think he produced a really good pass or maybe it was like a, a little turn away from his marker. And it wasn't the first time in the game the Bournemouth fans booed him, but this time they were just booing him because he was good. And I thought, <laughs> that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a positive day for him and a positive day for, for the young guys in the team, which isn't to say some of the other guys didn't play well. You know, good for Hector to get another 90 minutes under his belt. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious to see what, what this will mean for Sunday, um, you know, in terms of team selection. But that's something we can... Um, we can deal with in the podcast on on Friday um, when we look ahead to Burnley. You know, I thought maybe he might play Maitland Niles last night, for example, and play Bellerin against mm. Burnley. Um, is three games in a row a bit too much for him, considering you know the the problems that he had? We'll we'll wait and see. But you know, the the young guys they really took their chance. They really took their chance, and in a season when things have been difficult uh, and things have been. Uh, hard to find a lot of joy in uh, at certain times this season I think the the progress these guys are making the impact that they're having and the the playing time that they're getting that will only stand them in good stead ahead of next season and you know even between now and the end of the season is is probably the the big positive from a, a playing squad point of view yeah, and I think the experience these young players are getting, the manner in which they're growing, means that all the time our sort of 18-man squad is improving. You know, you looked at the Arsenal bench yesterday and it was exceptionally strong. We had Leno, Ceballos, Lacazette, Ozil, Torreira, Maitland, Niles, Holding. Mm. And we haven't been able to say that too many times this season. Now, granted, I'd expect at Burnley a lot of those names to come back in, but... You know, if it is Eddie Nketiah who drops out the team, well, you've got a guy who scored a goal against Premier League opposition a few days before. You know, those options, Joe Willock, maybe we're looking at him in a slightly different light after the way he played. So it, it gives Arteta more options. It creates competition. And I think as well, it's good for team spirit. I mean, I loved Saka and Martinelli's celebration, you know, mm. the beautifully choreographed chest bump. Very easy to get that wrong and just headbutt each other midair. Uh, <laughs> so they, they did very well in that regard. And Joe Willock, after the game, spoke glowingly of Eddie and Ketia. You know, he said, when, when he scores, I feel like I've scored. He talked about this idea that, you know, this group of friends, because that's what they are. They're guys who've played together since they were kids. Yeah. Can go on and be in the Arsenal squad, be in the Arsenal team together. It's it's difficult as a fan to not be very enthused by that prospect because sure. it's what we all want to see, isn't it? Yeah, we're looking potentially at the next generation of Arsenal. Yeah. You know, and a, a lot of... A, I, I think it's rare, actually, that a group of players with this much potential comes through at the same time you know, I know mm-hmm. we brought Martinelli in, and that's obviously, you know, a, a signing, but, you know, Willock 
Inketia, um, Saka, um, Smith Rowe, of course, is out on loan, you know, and, and is somebody who could come back perhaps next season and and uh, and try and make an impact as well. But you know, to have a kind of core of young players like that, I think is really really positive, really yeah. positive because they can grow up together. You know, Genduzi and um, you know, is I think we think of Genduzi as a kind of a more senior player than he actually is. You know, mm. he's he's still only twenty. Um, yeah. So you know. I think to to see the nascent stages of this next generation of Arsenal begin to um, establish themselves as players and potentially become part of the first team for, for years and years uh, is, is really very exciting. And, you know, it's not long ago, is it, that we were talking about the age profile of this team? We were talking about, well, we've got a lot of players around 30. You know, Mkhitaryan, mm. Ozil... Uh, Aubameyang, Lacazette, Socrates, Louise, of course, who were a bit older. You know, these guys, and we were thinking, oh, we probably have to do something about the age profile. I think we're doing it. I think we're doing yeah. it. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's, it, again, it's one of the things we have done better is that, you know, we've created room for these young players and it takes it takes a little bit of bravery to do that. I mean, Chelsea, you know, sort of, neglected to do it until they were forced to by a transfer ban we haven't had a transfer ban we've done it for strategic reasons and you know we pay for it at times you do with young players they are inexperienced they will make mistakes but it's the long term benefit that you're looking at and these guys could be the core of this Arsenal squad uh, you know for the next five, ten years and that's not to say they'll be the star players necessarily but you do need a core in that squad. You do need it sort of from a cultural perspective, from basic rules perspective. You need homegrown players in your squad if you want to yeah. compete in European competition. And to, to not have to go out and buy them and to have brought them through the academy would be really fantastic. And I, I really do believe that they've all got roles to play. I'm sure we might have questions about this in part two, but mm. there's not too many that I'm looking at and thinking, well, I, I don't think you've got a chance. I think they've all got a very real chance right now yeah I think so and you know it, it, it maybe teaches us you know um, just to have a little bit more patience um, I, it's interesting timing as well I think in the last week of the transfer window um, to see quite how well these young players are doing and 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 I know that you know funnily enough one of the areas of w in which we're in desperate need is centre half which isn't necessarily an area where we've got you know an 18 year old you know ready to step in right now Saliba's arriving in the summer but uh, you know in other areas of the pitch in advanced areas I think if you ask me well it's like the, the Kazawa thing you know if you look at it now and you say uh, well did we sort of dodge a bullet there I think you have to say we did and mm. I would be really saddened if a left back had come in and we weren't giving that development and that time to Saka because I I genuinely do yeah. believe that's a better investment than going out and spending money on somebody else. Yeah, I agree with you. Agree with you completely about the left back thing. You know, I think the central mm. uh, the center half thing. I'm not sure we've got somebody um, coming. That's up, a different issue. You know, I that think. Is, that is a different issue, and I think it is a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit easier. I'm not saying it's easy what Saka is doing, but I think it is kind of easier to slot somebody like him in at left back in the same way that we did with Maitland-Niles over on the right-hand side. And even when he started himself as, as a left back, you know, the full back positions, I think they're easier to teach uh, in terms of di discipline, positional discipline and what you need to do and where you need to be than uh, the centre of defence, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a position which demands such a uh, an amount of uh, experience and intelligence and reading of the game and, and awareness. It, it takes a lot of time to develop that. So um, we'll wait and see what they do. We probably have questions about transfers and stuff in part two, no doubt. But if there's nothing else, so. do you have anything else from from last time? I mean, I suppose people could say we, we could talk about the second half a bit more and how it wasn't great, but I, I feel like it's a bit redundant. You know, we had a really good first half. The young players did what they were supposed to do. We let in a late goal, a bit sloppy, you know, but in the end, I, I thought we were, we were good value for the win. Um, I don't think Bournemouth did anywhere near enough uh, to take us to a replay or, or anything close to it. Yeah, 
uh, and you know, I suppose with cup football, my inclination is always to think more about the result because that's what it's mm. about. It's about progression. We are through to face Portsmouth, isn't it, yep. in the fifth round, uh, which has a proper cup tie feel to it. And going back to Fratton Park, I seem to remember it was a cup tie that we played there and absolutely hammered them. Um, five, one. five one. Yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, I, uh, and the away fans were just in tremendous voice throughout the game and it was pretty miserable weather conditions on the way home from what I gather so great right. to those guys who travelled and uh, sort of you know faced the drive back because it was pretty pretty grim alright ok well look we will take a break right here we're going to come back with your questions and more in part 2 right after this Listen, you're more than your successes. Can't quit now. You're about that game. You're more than your failures. Drop it, give me head. You're the work. It's dirty work. Get it? There you are. Work that hurts. Work that defines you. It's that fire that burns inside you. You want that smoke? That was epic. Give him that fire. The only way is through. Under Armour. Welcome back to the Arscast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at GunnarBlog and at ArsBlog, not on Facebook, because I'm annoyed with Facebook today. So I didn't put Tell the thing why. up. Well, basically, uh, in the player ratings, uh, on one of the posts anyway, last night that we put out on ArsBlog News, there was, you know, a guy, somebody said, well, I hope the Mustafi injury isn't as bad as it looks. And this guy was like... Well, I hope it's just as bad as it looks. In fact, I hope it's worse than it looks because, you know, I never want to see him in the team again. Like the last sentiment, I understand. If you don't want to see him in the team, that's fine. I can understand why people are like that. You know, I can't lie and say that that's not something that I've thought myself. However, kind of celebrating in a guy's injury is just not something I can ever get behind. And Mm -hmm. I called him a dickhead. That's reasonable, I think. I think that's reasonable. Like, I'm not one generally for online abuse and that kind of thing, but I just thought, you're a dickhead. What are you saying that for? St- well, so a dickhead's not that bad, a dickhead, it? no, it's, like, it's not. Stop being a dickhead. Stop you know what I mean? being like, a dickhead, exactly. Exactly. Then, though, I got, like, a, a, a thing from Facebook reporting me to myself. Hang on, so... Y- you got a thing to ask Blog's Facebook page saying you need to ban this guy. It said you your comment goes against our community standards on harassment and bullying. I mean, <sighs> I think Facebook has got bigger fucking issues than me calling a dickhead a dickhead that it doesn't deal with on a fairly regular basis. Um, Absolutely. But in order to um, in order to get back into the account and, and manage the page that I mm. run and am the administrator of, I had to sort of accept this, um, the fact that I had gone against the community standards. So basically... Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to admit guilt. I have to admit guilt on my own fucking Facebook page, which is absolute bullshit. So, um, yeah. so there you go. Anyway... Everyone should boycott Facebook now. I response. think so. I think so. Um, it's a, you know, there's a big kind of community there on Facebook and Arsblog, but like, if I didn't have, if I didn't have Arsblog, I wouldn't be anywhere near Facebook, I have to say. Mm. Mm. But there you go. Anyway, uh, I was reported to myself by Facebook and I disciplined myself and now everything's back to normal, but not getting any questions on there today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Also, people can leave questions on the Discord channel on our Patreon. If you're a Patreon member, uh, you can leave questions in there as well. And we thank you for doing that. We'll take a couple from there uh, as we go along. Um, So do you want to go first or will I go first or what's going to happen here? Mm, I'll go first, shall I? Okay. So this question is from Twitter and it's from Arnab Mukherjee, who's at AAR... Hang on. (laughs) It's at A R N B twenty four. It's like an abbreviation of Arnab. Right. And Arnab says, with the recent link to Cedric Suarez of Southampton, 
Can you see a potential future for Ainsley Maitland Niles in central midfield, with Sabios reportedly wanting to return to Spain for game time? Mm. Um, yeah, rumours around today. I think it was reported in the Telegraph that Arsenal could be after Cedric Suarez at right back. Yes, um, interesting. I think he's only got six months left on his deal. Um, mm. I do wonder, I mean, I wonder if Mikel Arteta has seen enough in Ainsley Maitland-Niles at right back that makes him think he could do a job in central midfield. I'm not 100% convinced by that because I don't think Maitland-Niles has ever expressed a desire to play there. I think he's always talked about playing more as a winger rather than a central yeah. midfielder. Um, it, it comes, I think, because Arsene Wenger talked in the past, didn't he, about Maitland-Niles, how he was going to be a defensive midfielder. He would be a DM I think he's pretty yeah, much said, he, though, about everyone. He's everybody. And he promised me Theo Walcott was going to be a striker. Yeah. And Aaron Ramsey was going to be a goalkeeper. Callum Chambers like was that. going to be a DM. A, and, a number 10. Yeah. And <laughs> Davos Suke was going to oh, yeah. know, be a right back. We He loved doing that. It was one of his favourite. DMs was his particular mm. one, you know. Or or centre-back sometimes. <clears throat> like, he always talked about Gilberto's going to mm. go back to being a centre-back. Um, I, I the right back thing is interesting because back in December when Arsenal sort of set out their plans for the January transfer window right back was definitely on their list and I remember being a bit surprised by that at the time because I was like well Bellerin's kind of coming back and Ainsley Maitland-Niles can play there and when Ainsley Maitland-Niles played pretty well there in Mikel Arteta's first few games I yeah. thought well maybe that's out the door at this point but it's an interesting link, it, you know, simply because the player's deal is about to run out. You could get him on loan. You could probably get him for a very small fee. And maybe Ainsley Maitland-Niles is absolutely dead set that he doesn't want to be a right back. But oh, a but bit why, like why? Saka on the other side, I, I sort of feel like I'd happily make do with Maitland-Niles and, and Bellerin as well. Well, you like. know, if you're Ainsley Maitland-Niles, what... what you know, with the greatest of respect to him, what position are you in to say, I'm not going to play at right back or I don't want to play at right back? Because where else are you going to play for Arsenal right now? Yeah. You know, it's, I, it's, it's hard to see. So I, I yeah, mean, I can't, I can't imagine he has, you know, put his foot down and said, no, I don't want to play right back. I think he's, he'll just play where, where he's told to play. And if he's asked to play, I think he'd be, you know, quite happy to play first team football for Arsenal. So, unless. There are a couple yeah. of other possibilities, which are that either Arteta's looked at Maitland Niles and right back, and, at right back and thought, that's not for me. Or he's looked at him and said, as you alluded to, oh, I can see a good central midfield player there. Or a good player in another mm. position, let's say. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I just, yeah, it is a bit of a strange one, but as you said, there, there are, um, there are uh, reasons Rumblings. to believe that Arsenal were, you know, looking for a for a right back, and that might well yeah. s still be the case. So, um, I think so. Yeah, are you surprised that we've got to where we are in January without signing anyone? Um, never surprised with us. <laughs> uh, I am a little bit. I am a little bit, though, because, you know, the injury needs were pretty clear, you know, in terms of Chambers getting... When did when did Chambers get injured? Um, Early on in the month, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I forget now. But not, 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 uh, not too recently. Uh, and I thought... You know, they'd maybe want to get bodies in to help get us through quite a frenetic period. I mean, we've now went, we're sorry, we're one game away from our winter break. You know, our, where the Arsenal team are going to head off to Dubai for some yeah. warm weather training. I think they've got them some some time off as well with their families before that. So I, I am a bit surprised, but I mean, it does seem it's sort of not for the lack of trying. I mean, we literally had a footballer here <laughs> in the country only for him to slip through our fingers. Um, what a weird whole thing that was. Because yeah. it sort of happened on Friday night, if I recall correctly. Friday was or it Saturday Friday night. Friday yeah. or Saturday night? I can't Maybe remember. Maybe it was Saturday night or Sunday morning. But yes, uh, the stories broke in Brazil. Mm. And before we knew it, 
they were on the plane and, and Charles Watts was there to greet them. <laughs> Fair play to Charles. Fair play to Charles. Fair I mean, play to Charles for that. Be on the call of duty. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> but because of that, it's and it's quite... Well, I was going to say it's quite rare that we spot Arsenal doing that. It's becoming an increasing tendency, isn't it, to get papped within the club. You know, you think of Aubameyang when they turned up in Dortmund and we saw the Arsenal group there. And then you mm. think of Vinay outside Arteta's house after the Man, after the Man City game. And yeah. Now Charles Watts greeting Edu and Pablo Marie at the airport. They, mm. they need to be a bit, a bit more canny. Yeah, so it was Friday night when the story broke. Right. And then it was um, Saturday morning when he arrived at the airport with, like, way too much luggage for a guy who was always planning on going back to Brazil. Unless mm, he was sort yeah. of leaving stuff. I'll bring my pots and pans, but I'll go back and I'll, you know, I'll collect the sofa at another stage. Um, he had a lot of luggage for a guy who went back after, like, 36 hours. Very true. Very true. I mean, I can tell you that Arsenal um, insist that this was all planned, but then I suspect yeah. that is what they would say, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, you would say that. Does, I mean, I mean it, it doesn't really make a great deal of sense that your technical director goes all the yeah. way to Brazil. I know that's where he's from and everything else, but he goes to Brazil, he comes back across the Atlantic on an overnight flight, to be yeah, met by Charles Watts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's come back with a central defender. And within 36 hours, that guy is on his way back to Brazil. That's, you know, something's not right there. That's not, that's not everything going the way it might be assumed it would go. No, that's not 100% smooth. I mean, I think it's quite normal that if a deal gets done, they might say, okay, go back and sort out your personal affairs or whatever. That that can happen yeah. I mean, more commonly in Europe when it's not such a, an ordeal to fly halfway around the world. Uh, but clearly there is some discrepancy here over the sort of deal that, that the two clubs want. I mean, it's kind of amazing, really, that they allowed him to travel at all, given that that you know, that wasn't sorted. I mean, Arsenal have said all through this that they want a loan with an option. And when he arrived in London, Arsenal were communicating that that's sort of the deal that they were trying to do and that they thought was there to be done. Mm. The noises from Flamengo and certainly from their president have been very different. Do you think, I mean... He had to have had permission, right? I did see some stories yeah. where it said, oh, yeah. like, you know, he didn't have permission. No, he just course. took it on himself. Um, you know, he just turned up at Arsenal like Peter Odom Wingy, you know? <laughs> Sign no, I don't, think <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that is the case. Um, I'm sure he had permission. I do wonder, actually, and this is speculation on my part, but, like, if, you know, in Brazil, the club presidents are often quite public figures mm. and I do wonder how much posturing might be going on and how much of you know we can't be seen to be doing a bad deal with Arsenal might be at play for Flamengo um, because what I was told is that you know they would be open to a loan uh, someone quite who knows the club very well was like it wouldn't be a bad deal for them they would get a good chunk of money up front they would probably get some performance related bonuses it would put him in a shop window potentially and make him a, a valuable asset. So, you know, it's not necessarily the case that there's nothing in it for them to do the loan, but do, I think it, it might become an expensive loan. Do, do, do you think the issue might be whether the loan comes with an obligation to buy or an option? I mean, could this be where it's so. falling down? Like Arsenal, you know, I, I, th I don't think it's wrong by the way, for Arsenal to be just a little bit circumspect with this player based on mm. his career trajectory, right? He came to Man City. He didn't really uh, have any impact there. He, he spent a year in the Eredivisie. He spent two years in the Spanish second, second Division. division. He's yeah. gone from there to, to the Brazilian League. Um, you know, it's an unconventional career trajectory and he's 26 years of age and it's difficult to know you know, whether he's going to be ready for, for Premier League football. So if Arsenal are trying to sign the guy on loan, then I don't really have 
a big problem with that. I think that's probably not a bad way to go, particularly if you're looking at him as you know, potentially someone you might sign, but in the short term, he could at least give us a body and a little bit of depth and a little bit of security, you know, as we go towards uh, May and the and the end of the season. It just, the optics of it aren't great, are they? When, you know, you're a company back from uh, Brazil with Edu uh, to be met by Charles Watts and for him to not sign then. It just... No, I, I mean, I suppose in fairness to Arsenal, they didn't plan on, <laughs> on bumping into Charles Watts. If we didn't have the video footage of Edu arriving with the player, uh, it would probably feel slightly less, you know, like a circus. But hey, you know what? Yeah, I, haven't, I, think... I haven't seen Charles tweet anything for a little while. Do you reckon, do you reckon Arsenal have had him... He wasn't had him at the Bournemouth up? game, actually. Oh, I so... see a tweet there three hours ago. He's OK. He's safe and sound. It's good. That's what they want us to think. They've hacked his account and they are yeah, They've got his fingerprint. That's how you do it now. You just take him. <laughs> you got the fingerprint. You just, all exactly. they need is his finger. The rest of Charles is somewhere floating down the fucking... Charles! Charles, <laughs> Where Charles are, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I hope he is. But we hope and pray Charles Watts is okay. But uh, yeah, I, look, I agree with you about the loan. And the other thing to say about the centre-halves at Arsenal is there's loads of them. There's a lot of congestion in that part there is, of the squad. I have a question here, actually, on that, uh, which comes right. from Ade, who's at Adecola underscore, who says, with seven central defenders, so he says, Socrates, Louise, Holding, Chambers, uh, Mustafi, Mavropanos, and of course next season William Saliba will be an Arsenal player when he finishes his loan with uh, his former club Saint-Étienne. Yeah. And with the possible addition of uh, Marie, who are you getting rid of to make room for our version of Virgil van Dijk? Or do you think we're getting no central defenders this summer? Yeah, I mean, it's too many central defenders, isn't it? That's for sure. It is. I, I mean, suppose, if you add one, that makes eight. It, it, so w- would a Pablo Marie be the eighth? Is that, am I right? Yeah. Is that the right maths? So Saliba would be the seventh. Um, well, I think the first name I'd cross off that list would be Mavropanos, I have to say. Yeah. Um, p- 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 Callum Chambers, is he really an option at the moment? Is that a problem we have to worry about given... Well, I think he's gone for a year. I think if we're looking at this time next year before Callum Chambers is really going to be ready to to play frequently again. So I'm down to six now. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the question is, I don't think we can get rid of Louise. I just think he's on too much money and I don't see how that would happen. So I think he'll still be here. And I'm not saying we would want to necessarily. Um, I think Rob Holding... Well, I don't know, you know, with Rob Holding. I don't know. I think it's too early. I think it's too soon to sort of put him in the outdoor. I I do think he's, you know, at a point where he's got something to prove uh, and everything else. But I think the mitigating factors regarding his injury and the absence and and all that kind of stuff, I think they come into factor. I think you have to, like, just try and think about how a few weeks ago people were maybe thinking about Hector Bellerin and thinking, ooh, maybe. Is there, you know, do we have to? And then he comes back in and reminds you of why, you know, A, he, he, he's going to be a, a very good player for us and why we thought so highly of him in the first place, you know? Maybe, but I do think that given that Rob Holding's sort of not really going to play any regular football next this season, I do think we might be in a position where there's a case, especially given that he's under long-term contract, for him maybe going out on loan to, mm. to a good club, like a Premier League club. I mean, I, I think of Chris Smalling at Manchester United who's gone to Roma and really gone from strength to strength there and I mean they're expected to sign him permanently but if he came back to United he would come back a much better player yeah but how old is Chris Smalling now he must be 30 he's 30 Chris Smalling's not a young player anymore he's 30 James James remember how many but how old is he he's 24 I still think, well, in some ways, I think all the more reason for him to need that Mm. football. I just think there might be a case. I don't know how he's going to get enough football otherwise. If we still have, I mean, who else can we get rid of from that list, do you think? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I think Mustafi, you know, I think, you know, all things considered, um, he would be... 
he will be the guy to go. I agree with you about Mavropanos. I, I just can't see it at this point. Um, but I Congestion think, is a factor. You know, yeah. it's, a young player, talent isn't the only thing. There also has to be opportunity. I think there'd be, you know, there's not enough to be made from selling Socrates. And I think there is benefit to his experience, probably. Um, yeah, what do you get for Socrates now? Yeah, that's it. Uh, I don't really think it's sort of worthwhile. I mean, this is the problem for Arsenal. I mean, we had a question actually from Anders Janssen on Twitter. And the question was just, do we really need Pablo Marie? I think we need somebody. I think we so need what somebody. what have we got now? We've got Holding... Socrates, uh, Louise Socrates, and Louise. Mustafi with a Maybe big asterisk. Mustafi. Yeah. Yeah. With a big asterisk. Um based on, you know, whatever sort of injury he's got. So you think we need something for definite at centre-half? I think... Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky from the point of view that, like, one of the things that that um, came to the fore during the, the, the week with regards to Pablo Marie was the... The, either the unwillingness or the inability for Arsenal to pay the kind of fee that Flamengo wanted, right? Um, I think unless the player you're getting in January is a player that you want, that you would spend money on in the summer, mm. then don't spend money on him. Yes. You know what I, I mean? I, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, at I the same, t- yeah, you. at the same time, there is a numbers issue, a depth issue, particularly like let's say we find out this week that Mustafi is going to miss the rest of the season. I think then we kind of have to bite the bullet a little bit, and we have to either spend the money or make the loan so lucrative for um, for Flamengo. Flamengo that they 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 can't turn it down, or you try and bring forward. Uh, a target from from elsewhere, but I think that's really really difficult in the in the January window. So you have to yeah, balance. I mean, maybe that's the Ukrainian guy yeah. whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. You know, he he's someone who's been linked with Manchester City, someone who's played against Manchester City. So you feel like it's someone Arteta will know. I mean, I'm sure he knows Marie a little bit too. But I think he's a slightly higher caliber of player from what I have gathered. It's very difficult for me to say mm. definitively because I've not really watched them. Um, but you know, well, he's a he's a full international, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. You know, so that feels more like a, a signing that we might be able to move forward if that deal can be done. Also, left sided yeah. as well, isn't he? Left sided as well. Mm. I mean, there's a theme there. His uh, name is you know, uh, Mikola Matvienko. That's it, Matvienko. Matvienko. Um, I say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but given that, you know, David Luiz plays on the left side of the centre-halves for Arsenal and given how, I mean, not to say he can't play on the right, but given how good he's been and how important he's been to our build-up, you know, we are probably buying a player here who's not going to come into the team straight away. And I can kind of understand Arsenal's hesitation to spend money on someone who by the summer, even, could be a bit sort of surplus to requirements. Yeah. And, I, and I slightly have that fear with Pablo Marie. Yeah, yeah, that's why, you know, when talking about it, I thought a loan deal might make sense. Um, mm-hmm. Because it is a risk. However good he's been for Flamengo, the, the career trajectory he's taken just illustrates it is a bit of a risk. You know, yeah, like, it's a like every signing. Like he, but, yeah, and he's done really well at Flamengo. And sometimes defenders do develop late. I mean, Chris Smalling's 30 and he's mm. just started to be good. Uh, but, you know, Lauren Koscielny had a really unconventional career path you know he was in the French second division um, and sort of was a late bloomer so it does happen mm. but there is risk there and I I do sympathise with the club wanting to do the right thing I think if we can get a body in on loan I think that we should definitely do it at centre half but mm. yeah I'm not sure we should be spending huge huge money all right. Um, have we any, any other transfer-related questions? I mean, I... Well, I had this one from Highbury Days, which is kind of transfer-related, which said, 
What did you make of Danny Ceballos' defence blitzing through balls to Saka? Isn't that what we expect from mm. Mesut? Should we use him until the end of the season as he may thrive in Arteta's system? Uh, and I thought mm. maybe that was a way into the, the Danny Ceballos question more generally. I mean, were you surprised that he didn't start yesterday? No. No, I think... I think... Um, if Arteta is going to use these games to develop players for this season and probably for next season, it makes more sense to play someone like Joe Willock, who yeah. is going to be an Arsenal player next season. And I don't think Danny Ceballos will be an Arsenal player next season. So no. from that point of view, I mean, he might not be an Arsenal player by the end of the transfer window. I mean, that that's not dead, is it? It's not dead. I mean, I think uh, Valencia were his main suitors and certainly at the weekend... They were optimistic about doing something. I think they might be getting the guy who Man United were in for. Fernandez, is it? The right. Central midfielder. I think he might be joining Barcelona and Valencia on loan. So if he does do that, then that might close a door for Ceballos. I mean, I agree with you. And I, I, I look at it and I think, well, I think Mikel is probably a bit loath to invest in somebody who isn't going to be here yeah. in six months. What did uh, you What did you think of him when he came on? Because there were a couple of moments when I looked at him and I thought, holy shit, you look like you're running through treacle. He just looked <laughs> like the legs were heavy. Maybe it's because he hasn't played in a while, but, you know, he's been fully fit or certainly in terms of training. So you would expect in, you know, a, a short cameo, he shouldn't look like a guy who's struggling to get from one side of the pitch to the other. But it struck me a couple of times as I saw him running, it was like, oh, that's like, that's not what I expected from him. Mm, and it's it's not just without the ball. I mean, even with, with the ball too, I think he... He can dally. He can sort of dwell on the ball longer than Arteta would like. I mean, Arteta uh, really let him have it from the sidelines on a couple of occasions last night, especially soon after he came on, because he wanted him, I suppose, a bit like Willock, although he's playing slightly deeper, to kind of find spaces between the lines, you know, offer an option to yeah. to Genduzi and to Shaka, and he just wasn't doing it well enough. I mean, I know the question asked about Meza Ozil, but what's one of Meza Ozil's major talents is his his movement, his ability to sort of sense where the space is going to be and be in a position to receive the ball. And Ceballos, he doesn't quite do that. I mean, there were a couple of good passes through to Saka. And I do think he's a talented player. I think for all the, the Dennis Suarez comparisons, I think he's a, a better pedigree. This is a guy who, you know, is involved in the Spain national squad, which Dennis Suarez at senior level hasn't really been. Um, but it, at the moment, it feels like it wouldn't be a massive loss, to be honest. Uh, mm. I don't think Arsenal would let him go without a replacement, but uh, yeah, I can't get too cut up about it personally. Yeah. Look, he had that, that good game against Burnley and then, you know, it was pretty average, which is true of a lot of players. And, uh, you know, the injury, I think, had a, a fairly big impact on his season. The departure of Unai Emery had a big impact on his season. Yeah. The fact that, you know, he wasn't around when Arteta took over because he was doing rehab in Madrid, um, you know, from his hamstring injury. Um, and you know, it was a substantial injury. And yeah, yeah. I, I think the Emery thing is probably overlooked a bit. I mean, Emery was key to getting Ceballos to come. They had, you know, several conversations, I think, and he was a big part of his plans. And, it, it, you know, it, it didn't work out. He got injured, Emery got sacked. And I think, well, the, the player's perspective is that he wants to play because it's the Euros in the summer and he's worried about his place. And I can see why he's worried about his place. I mean, I think mm. 18 minutes he's played since early November. So... I can understand him wanting to get out. I yeah. don't think Arsenal can sanction it without someone else coming in, do you? No, I don't think so, unless this could explain the right-back slash Maitland-Niles right Maitland thing. Maitland-Niles thing, yeah, potentially. Perhaps, perhaps, I don't but know. they're very different players, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are, they are. But look, I, I think what's been interesting is that Arteta has been fairly forthright, um, you know, about Ceballos. You know, said he's a good player, he's watched him a lot, I like him, but he's got to get fit. He's got to get fit and compete for a place. And I think that tells you maybe a bit about what's going on as well. So Yeah, one, one of the interesting things from Sabas' side, um, people close to him say, well, I don't think Arteta's sort of been clear enough about what he, he wants Sabas to do. But, I mean, 
as you've just said, it's quite transparent, isn't it? He wants him to be fitter. Mm. Uh, the player thinks he's fit, but mm. Arteta clearly has a higher standard. All right, well, look, we'll see whether Danny Ceballos lasts the rest of the season with Arsenal, whether something might happen before the transfer window at midnight on Friday. No, midnight, 11pm on Friday, the transfer window closes. Ah, oh, bollocks. That's going to be a long day. Yeah, that's a shit Friday that's night. A actually, long, that's a long, that's a, yeah, going to do the line. It's a long block. day of waiting for a defender who never turns up or does turn up and then leaves again shortly afterwards. <laughs> in, a, in a perfectly scheduled return to his homeland. Will it be worth it? Probably not. We'll wait and see, though. Okay, here's a question from the Discord. It comes from Limpar84, and he says, controversial one. So get Ooh. ready. Okay, I'm ready. Acknowledging that Genduzi had an impactful second half where we needed an almost chaotic energy in midfield, I can't decide how I feel about him. I'm optimistic for his future, but I don't see the, the things that some people rave about. Burgeoning technical ability shows him flashes, but his propensity to hold on to the ball too long to buy a foul or unnecessarily incite frustration from opposition players, which awakens subdued home fans, really frustrates me. So what do we think? Unpolished gem or just a more athletic Robbie Savage? <laughs> Uh, I mean, he's definitely a, a, another wind-up merchant, but I I think there is a lot of there is a lot of talent there. I think the th the, the trouble with assessing Gunduzi is I think the things that he does exceptionally well aren't the most showy things on a football pitch. They aren't things that make you go, wow, you know, like you know Joe Willock banging a thirty-yard goal against Liverpool. You know, Gunduzi's not done that he's probably never going to do that um he's not someone who will nutmeg a guy although his footwork was good yesterday he he does a lot of you know Didier Deschamps called it water carrying in the French national team and he does a lot of that he shuttles around he covers ground he moves the ball but it's not stuff that makes your jaw drop but I don't think that means it's not valuable and it doesn't require a lot of talent and the greatest thing I think that makes Gunduzi stand out amongst his age group is his maturity and his confidence you know very mm. very few people play successfully in the Premier League at 18 years of age very few and he did you know relatively successfully and yeah I think you know I, I, that's not to say that he's perfect but I think there is there is. I personally feel there is a big potential there. Um, do I think he's going to be? You know, I remember there was points last season where I think our colleagues on the Arsenal Vision podcast had a debate about if you would accept a hundred million for Genduzi, and there was this, there was you know different answers. And I don't think he's ever going to be a player of that level. That's my personal opinion. I think he's a good midfield player. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's necessarily, you know, that top, top sort of Fabregas level bracket. But I think there's definitely enough there to be worked with and encouraged by. What What do you think? Um, I think he's a guy who has a lot of potential. There's a lot of raw potential there. I think there's a lot of personality in his game. I get the frustration when he kind of winds people up. Mm. But at the same time, I kind of like it. I like a guy who does that, who's got the confidence yeah. to do that. I like when we annoy the opposition. And when we annoy opposition fans, I enjoy it. Mm. Um. But he's what got I a massive personality, sorry, just to say, I mean, the way in which, as a teenager, he's prepared to sort of take on the mantle of pantomime villain, I mean, you know, I haven't seen that really since Cristiano Ronaldo. And, uh, you know, personality is only a small part of what happens on the pitch, but his stands out. I mean, he's a big character in a team that's not packed with them. No, I agree. I agree. And it's sort of that classic thing, whereas if he played for somebody else, you'd hate him. You know, that way. Oh, I mean, imagine if he played for Spurs. I mean, he is, you know, 
mm. I, I'm sure they feel about him like we feel about Deli Alley. He's an infuriating player yeah. for opposition fans. I'd say he's but, a really annoying little prick when you're playing yeah. against him. But, but you know, he's our little prick. <laughs> he's our little prick, exactly. And I think what we have to do is, you know, A, if a guy doesn't have anything to back up that prickosity, if he's mm. just a prick who can't play, then that's no good. But I think what we've seen with Genduzi is that there is a player in there and that there is somebody who, who's got talent and who can kind of back up that, that little bit of arrogance or that desire to, to wind the opposition up because he can play well and he can do things with the ball. I, I do think the, the buying of free kicks is something referees are beginning to get a little bit wise to. I think yeah. they're I think they're not quite it was one giving last him night, yeah. I think where and I think it was a no. foul actually. I remember the one yeah. you were talking about. I think it was a foul, but I just think the referee went, "Ah here. You do this a bit too much." So, you know, on we go. And they will do that. They do it with mm. players who dive in the penalty box, you know, they go through a spell where they don't really give them anything in a sort of attempt to sort of, you know, get it out of them. It happened to Gareth Bale, I yeah. remember. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. I think you're right if they get wise to it and start doing that. Mm. But, you know, um, I think in general, I think a coach like Arteta is going to be good for him. I think Arteta, you know, as a central midfield player, has a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom to impart to Gendouzi. And and there are things that you're not going to want to rein in. And there are other things that you you just maybe want to channel in a different way. You don't want to take out the enthusiasm. You don't want to take out that desire to win, that desire to, to you know, to, to wind up the opposition um, primarily because you, it might put them off and those kind of things. But I think you've got to channel them in the right way. Um, and I'm confident Arteta can give him a bit more structure in his game, mm. teach him a bit more about the positional side of things. I think there were moments last night where I thought, okay, I can see that there's some work gone in here in terms of where you are on the pitch when things happen. You know, um, he's not normally somebody who, um, when the ball comes into our box, is in the right place at the right time to make clearances. And a few times last night he was. I even saw him win a few headers. Yeah, um, I did as well, actually. I noticed that. And that, that, in fairness, is an improvement. Yeah. Because he's not a great, header of the ball it's just not sometimes he wasn't even challenging for them before I mean yeah. He, he, yeah he did put himself about in the air against Bournemouth so I think you know I, I, I'm I'm a bit cautious because I think there are flaws in his game but I'm a bit more positive about being able to turn those flaws into into turn those frowns upside down if you like you know yeah um, I feel like he's got the right coach do you know what I mean? I, I mm. think you couldn't really ask for someone better than Mikel Arteta who understands that central midfield position, who will bring that structure. And just to say, I, I sort of take back what I said about what he might end up as, because if there's one thing Arsene Wenger taught me, he always said you should never put limits on anybody's potential. You know, he turned Emmanuel Adbayor into this £30 million striker, mm. 30 goal season striker, which I never saw coming. He turned Alex Song into you know, a player who Barcelona wanted to buy. So you never know with players development it can it can go so many different directions. But I do think broadly the raw materials with Gunduzi are are really promising. And I, I think I think he suffers slightly from not having one outstanding thing that he's really good at that enables people to go, Oh, that's his thing. Yeah. Um but I think as a central midfield player having that versatility and having lots of different skills is very valuable. Mm. Yep. Yep. I think it's a, it's a, he is the right coach. He's got the right coach and, you know, it's up to him to, to get the head down and work hard. You know, he's in the France squad or has been called up to the France squad. So, you know, there's a recognition of the potential and the talent. It's now about, you know, driving on and, and really um, giving it a bit of a fine polish. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I thought this was a really interesting question. Have we got time for it? Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's from Ace Rimmer. <laughs> at the Ace Rimmer of Red Dwarf fame. Oh, um, okay. I thought he was just bigging himself up there for sure. a sec. I mean, maybe he is, actually. Maybe I've read that wrong. Uh, while he's undoubtedly impressing, the question says, is there anything you've seen from Arteta that speaks to his lack of experience as a manager? 
As we keep an eye on our players improving under him, what kind of growth should we be looking for in our fresh-faced boss? Wow. Um, this is a question, isn't it? Because, you know, inherently we, uh, we we think of managers as kind of a finished product, but the chances are he will improve too. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that, that occurs to me is sort of in-game management and mm. learning... Um, how to deal with different scenarios in games. Like, he, he won't be completely um, inexperienced in that regard because he sat beside Pep Guardiola for, what, two seasons, two and a half seasons? Mm-hmm. Um, so he's seen a lot and he's played, of course, so he knows he knows how it goes. Um, I just think recognising situations within games or, or finding a way to turn things around when they go wrong, I'm not sure he's yeah. necessarily had to do that yet with us has he because in a lot of the games that we've played under Arteta I think we've scored first in quite a lot of them Mm. Um, so he hasn't really had to rescue anything has he no and I think there's been a real focus on sort of implementing a structure and implementing a plan but I guess with time uh, he will be able to sort of make little deviations or alterations to that identity uh, and I think Guardiola was basically the same and, and Klopp's been the same too. Once you've built that blueprint, you can fiddle with it a bit and it'll be interesting to see what he does in terms of flexibility at, at that point. Um, I mean, it just seems yeah. on a very basic level that, you know, with more experience, he will get better at the job, assuming that that's the, you know, that's the way it works for most people in a job. When you, mm. when you get used to it, when you get more comfortable, when you feel you know, a little more in control. Um, you should be better at it. But of course, you're kind of, I'm not going to say at the mercy of your players or, or what have you. Um, you know, I, it's not like he can go out and play the games himself, you know, that way. Yeah, I mean, I think with the in-game stuff, there's been a bit of debate about substitutions, you know, either you can you can see it as he's very considered with his substitutions, he explores different options, or you can see it as there's a little bit of indecision there on a couple of occasions, or maybe they've come a bit late. Uh, so I think that, in terms of in-game things, might be something that shifts slightly. Um, uh, this isn't really about him as a... As a, as a manager necessarily. But one of the things that's interesting is that when he's come into this squad, he's sort of said that thing of, I'm giving everybody a clean slate. And to a certain extent, he has to work with the players at his disposal. You know, it's not mm. easy to make big changes in January. So even if he did think, oh, do you know what? I don't, I don't want Mustafi around. He's not a Mikel Arteta player. It doesn't necessarily mean he can enact that change at this midpoint in the season. I'll be really interested to see, come the summer, if maybe there's a bit more ruthlessness in his assessment of players mm. and individuals and their fit yeah. within his plans. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think there probably will be. I think there will be, because it's the right time for it. Yeah. It's the right time for it. I mean, he can't come in to a football club in December and say, I'm giving everybody a clean slate you know, give everybody gets a fresh Until start the under me open. <laughs> and then like bomb out three players in January. I mean, leaving aside the practicalities of it, you can't go into a dressing room and have the players believe in what you say if you do that, which is why I think to some extent um, some of his defense of Mustafi was like that. You know, mm. Mustafi made a mistake against Chelsea. He didn't criticize Mustafi. He talked about how when a player makes a mistake, everyone has to pull together to try and make up for that, Right. So yeah. that, you know, is maybe not the, the message that people who are very frustrated with Mustafi would like to hear. You know, they want to hear Mikel Arteta, you know, uh, say, yes, I am going to bring um, Skodran Mustafi to the top of a hill and I'm going to crucify him in front of all of you and you can dance around like, you know, crazy pagans. Uh, that mm-hmm. would go down very well with some people. But, the, you know, the reality of the situation is you can't do that. Um, it's not legal to crucify people <laughs> at the top of hills, but, you know, it has an impact on how you're viewed by your players, you know? And this idea, yeah. if you want to create a kind of environment of togetherness, if you want to create, a, uh, create an environment of us against them, which is a good environment to create, you can't do it if you hang somebody out to dry 
regardless of how easy it's going to be. So I think the summer will be the time where he will have made his mind up about quite a number of the players, um, mm-hmm. about what they're deserving of and, and who's going to stay and who's going to go and who needs to be replaced or who needs who needs to be made a bit marginal. Um, but that's that just seems like a natural time to do that. So Yeah, yeah. So, and, you know... It- in a way, it will be uh, the whole of next season will, particularly the early period, be a, a learning curve for him because it's his first preseason. It's his first full mm. season. I um, mean, you know, this period, I think he's doing really well, but there's a lot of fact finding going on. There's a lot of sort of R and D, and and come the summer, he can enact, I think, yeah. a lot more change. A little question here, just going back to Saka um, and James Lowe, who's at Lowey one three three, says. Um, Saka, his future is at the left side of a front three. Does the emergence of Martinelli and Saka mean we should sell one or both of Lacazette or Aubameyang to free up playing time for them and raise, where well, he says, 100 million uh, during this rebuild period? I'm not sure we get 100 million for for uh, for the two of them together. Um, no, I, I think... But we will get that, money, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean... I. I, I I think that come the summer, there might be a, a case for that. I, I don't think it's something Arsenal could contemplate in the January window, but I think, especially given the contractual situation, the fact that we might lose a Bamiang certainly for free, you know, within 12 months of that, Lacazette, you know, not too long after. So I think there is a case for that, regardless of whether you think Saka's future is at left wing, or at left back, I just think that in as part of the regeneration of this squad, one of those guys might go. And yeah. actually, at some point, if you've got young attacking talent like Martinelli, like Saka, other people who could come in and play in that front three, even like Smith Rowe, and I mean they're very high on Falar and Balogun as well. I know that he's very young, eighteen years old, but. Arsenal have rejected a bid from Brentford for him in this window of more than £5 million. He's another big, big prospect. Uh, I think at some point you've got to give those guys, you know, the the run of it. So I think, yeah, I can see a situation where one goes in the summer. I'd be very, very surprised if it was both. What do you think? I think one, yeah, for sure. Um, It's such a difficult one, isn't it? Because... You know, we, we, we let Ramsey go for free and we let Welbeck go for free and we left, you know, the best part of, you know, 40 to 60 million pounds mm. on the table because of that. If we're struggling financially to do a deal for a mid-range central defender in January, that's got to be a key consideration when it comes to the summer. That we can't, as a football club, regardless of how important... A particular player is allow him to leave for free again. I just don't think we can do that. Well, we were told it wouldn't happen. Yeah, we, we, we were, were told it wouldn't. Well, we were told, told. like uh, Ralph and yeah, he said yeah. When player gets to two years, you either sell him or um, well, he signs. He yeah. signs, and, and we're in a position not done that. Yeah, because it's not just Obama Yang either. It's it's Ozil as well. This summer, well, so yeah, yeah. That's I mean, a that's special a special case. Yeah. I think. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, but but um, yeah, it, 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 it's a, uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, it, I was thinking about it from Mikel Arteta's perspective. I really don't think he would be particularly keen to lose either of those players from a coaching point of view. No, of course not. Of course not. But it's sort of a case that like Obama Yang is the one you would most don't want to leave or to lose but is mm-hmm. probably the one you have to sell given the contractual situation. Yeah. So it's a and fuck And given up. that you might get another chance to sell Lacazette. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas I don't, you know, it's your only chance to get your money back on Aubameyang. It's a really, really difficult one. And it basically depends, I think, on if if Arteta fancies Aubameyang through mm. the middle. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? I think I think it comes down to that really, or if he feels I need a centre forward who provides more of a focal point, um, because as a, as a left winger, Martinelli, let's say, as a replacement for Aubameyang, you know, uh, granted it's a massive ask, but it's a uh, it's doable, I think. But you know. Pfft, 
Yeah, I think it comes down to if he's who he wants to be his starting centre forward next season, essentially. Yeah. I'm not sure we know, do we? I know he's played like no. I said there and put Aubameyang out, but I think when you're when you're in a position that Arteta's in, you've just come into a football club at the most difficult time of the season to come in. You're kind of banking on the big names. He wants both those players on yeah, the pitch. He, exactly. You know, you don't have goals all over the place, so you need those guys on the pitch. And also, they're experienced. They know what to do. They know the drill. You know, they're relatively easy to coach, I would say, in terms of their understanding of the game, their understanding of each other, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But the emergence of Martinelli in the last couple of weeks, I think will give Arteta a decision to make. I think it gives it because he's, you know, he's playing so well that it's difficult to leave him out. And then it becomes an either or between Obama Yang and Lacazette. Mm. And I, I think you're right. I think we don't yet know what Arteta thinks mm. out of those two, if he had to pick one mm. at centre forward. And, and that might be what makes the decision. But mm. I'm not confident that they will both be here at the start of next season. Mm. me neither but we'll wait and see which one it is um, I think we better leave it there no because we've yeah, been going a it. while um, what was I going to say I can't remember what I was going to say ah, it doesn't matter does it it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter busy few days I guess hopefully anyway in the chance window there might be a few things there might be happening there might be you, any, any prediction for you I mean I know we made our original predictions but God, they're so predictions. wrong already aren't I they I know way so, wrong Way wrong. We've got Shaka leaving. We've got money being spent. I still have a sneaky feeling we're going to get two players in, but I don't mm. think we're going to buy them. I think we might get a couple of loan signings. That's my prediction. Two loans. Two, two loans. loans. Uh, two loans don't make her white. Oh, wrong. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, we will have an arse cast on Friday. Uh, looking ahead to the Burnley game on Sunday. And after that, there's like a two-week gap, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Um, mid-season break, the guys Should are going we go off to... to Dubai? No. Let's, <laughs> let's not. Let's not. It's a bit far. It's a bit far, yeah. you know. We could just stay at home and, you know, not go there. I agree. And actually, there is football on. It's not all the teams, their breaks are staggered, aren't they? So there are, there are oh, games yeah, on both weekends. Oh, yeah, there's still some... Some yeah. Premier League stuff going on. Yeah, okay. Well, And famously an FA Cup match that Liverpool are really cross about. That's a bit mad. Why are they cross about it? Like, what's the problem um, here? I've got some bad news, by the way, to finish the podcast. Oh, no, what? Ac- according to Osman the Gooner, Kazawa Juventus is off, according to Italian media. Uh-oh. It couldn't Uh-oh. mean... oh Couldn't mean... It couldn't. <laughs> um, no, surely not. Surely, surely not. not. Surely not. Um, yeah, I don't give it like Jesus. Liverpool know the fucking rules. They know the rules know, of the FA it's Cup. Ridiculous. All you got to I mean, do they is can do what they want. But if they lose, they lose. Do you know what I mean? There's no point complaining about it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to rest all your, if you want to play the kids, play the kids. Play the kids. But, I do think your manager should manage the game, though. Yeah, that's weird. That you know, is weird. Just manage your team to beat Shrewsbury in the first place, mate. And you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. Good point. Well made. You know, and like, let's face it, this is an opportunity for Shrewsbury as well from a financial point of view. That's It's one of the, one of the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the magic of the cup things, isn't it? Where a lower league team gets to go play at Anfield or Highbury or oh, the Emirates or whatever. You yeah. know, and it makes them money. And it's Absolutely. really valuable money for, for lower league teams. And Liverpool are selling all their tickets for like 50p. Yeah, that's a shame. I, I, I think they've conducted themselves very odd. Yeah, really not great. Scenario. I don't think it's great. I mean, I understand the priorities. I do completely and utterly understand the priorities. But when you enter a competition, you can't just decide, well, no, I don't want to manage the team for that game. You're the manager. No, I mean, it all comes back to the Club World Cup, really, doesn't it? I mean, that's what sort of well, fuck their fixture list. But if you want to walk around, it. swanning around, calling yourself world champions all the time. Yeah. Then. Exactly. You know, With big, like, price. world champion tattoos on your foreheads and stuff, like they all have now. Yeah. Yeah. I think they do. They do. 
They're an invisible ink, though, so it's fine. <laughs> they only show up when you go into a nightclub and they scan your hand with that, <laughs> with that thing. Black, black. All right. Let's leave it okay. there. James, thank yes. you as ever. Thank you, everyone, for Pleasure. listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>